Hamadou, Michael. Hi, David. David. Fine, thanks. Excellent. How are you? Very good, thank you. Looking forward to the session. Sure, thanks. James, hi there. Hi, hi. Meet Michael, I think we're missing uh, just one more. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Frank. Hello, everyone. Great. Well done for being on, right. on time and working out the tech. It's always a bit of a, 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 a hit and miss, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Casey, hi. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, Casey. Lovely to see you all, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you managed to, to catch the presentation just now. Um, and we're all really looking forward to this discussion. So I'm going to hand over to you right away. We're a little bit on time, so I'll let you. Am I live now, Casey? Yeah? Okay, all are live. Everybody can see us. Live. Good. Okay. All right. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Casey. Yeah? And um, welcome to my panelists who I want to give uh, a brief really. introduction to before we uh, before we kick into the detailed discussion from each of you. I'm getting feedback from someone. Can I suggest we mute until I call on you to speak speakers? That's great. Thank you. All right. So with us today in the panel discussion, we have uh, James Archer. He is the director for growth and development in economic policy at National Treasury for South Africa. He holds an MSc in finance and economics and has over a decade of experience dealing with intergovernmental relations, public finances and urban development and infrastructure. And although he is now looking at macroeconomic issues, I know, James, that this is where you are. So welcome back to Housing and Human Settlements, which you did spend a number of years in uh, over, uh, over, over the last uh, dec decade of your work. Secondly, Dr. Frank Giamfi Yeboa, he holds a degree in real estate from Georgia State University and has a master's degree in real estate finance from the University of Cambridge. He's a senior lecturer in real estate finance and investment for the Department of Land Economy at KNUST and a member of the Ghana Institution of Surveyors. He's published widely and also consulted for numerous organizations, including IFC and UN Habitat. Then we have Dr. Michael Mba. He is a principal economic statist statistician at, and the head of re, uh, real estate statistics at the Central Bank of Nigeria. He has expertise on national accounts, prices, and labor statistics, and coordinates various national surveys and the compilation of uh, various Nigerian data programs uh, at the Central Bank. He also does a lot of interagency collaboration to develop a national data repository for the real estate sector, which I'm really looking to talk, looking forward to talking to him about, which involves public, private, and multilateral organizations across Nigeria. Dr. Mba holds a PhD in public policy analysis uh, and an MS in information and communications technology and a bachelor in statistics. Then, uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Hamadou Sorgo, who is operations officer for the IFC last time he checked, although in this fast moving world, his, um, his uh, roles seem to change uh, as fast as his office space. Um, Hamadou, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, in spe specifically, we're really looking forward to delving into your detail of Rwanda and Kenya and the advisory work that you've been doing on creating markets. Uh, he has been part of the team that has developed the Kenya and Rwanda country private sector diagnostic processes for the IFC and the World Bank and has been instrumental in carrying this through into investable strategies in those two countries. And while he works across agribusiness, tourism and various other sectors, also spent a fair amount of time working in housing. And it is with that in mind that we have asked him to join us and give us his, his positions and points of view. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Now, uh, what I have asked you to do is to prepare 10 or 11 minutes of thoughts uh, around your answers from your specific country's perspective on these four questions. Firstly, how do you view the role of housing construction and real estate as an economic driver? Secondly, 
how does your country's development and economic growth strategy support or indeed not support housing as an economic sector and an economic growth sector? Thirdly, what are the urgent actions that can be implemented to drive the role of housing in the social and economic post-COVID recovery situation? And finally, what are your views on the role of data and information as a basis for understanding and driving the housing economy? And within those four questions, I've asked each of you to specifically focus on particular aspects of your experience to bring depth to the discussion in order that we can then uh, complete uh, this hour having some general open discussion and perhaps answering some questions from the uh, uh, people involved in the session. So with, without any further ado, I'm going to ask James to start. Um, James Archer, would you mind starting your first 10 minutes? I'm going to give you a, a two minute warning if that's okay, so that you know that you have to. Uh, so over to you. Hey David, can you hear me? And uh, hello to my yes. fellow uh, panelists and uh, thank you very much for the privilege uh, of uh, joining you guys on such an important topic. Um, so on your first question, uh, how do we view the role of housing construction? Um, um, as part of an economic driver in South Africa in particular. I'm not going to delve too much or dwell too much on this uh, discussion because, or this topic, because uh, you've already um, covered that quite well in your presentation, David. But basically, we know that it's not only about the, uh, the building and the construction, it's also about the other indirect effects of the sector, including you know, services, legal services, financial services, utilities. Uh, as well as demand for no, uh, durable and non-durable goods. I mean, people need to buy a kettle for the house, they have to buy food, put food on the table. Uh, then there's you know, transport, uh, public transport or, or cars or taxis need to be brought into, into the play. And then of course, not to mention the labor intensity of construction, which assists with generating much needed uh, jobs and wages uh, in, in our countries in particular. So all of these provide an incredible multiplier effect, which, which you've highlighted, David. Uh, off of the direct construction and real estate activity. Now, in relation to South Africa, there is significant scope for housing construction and real estate to play a more important and pivotal role in economic recovery and growth. Just for example, residential investment in South Africa used to account for over 20% of gross fixed capital formation in the late 1980s. Uh, but now in the 2019-2020, it only accounts for 8%. Now, considering that South Africa has a huge demand or backlog for housing, almost 2.3 million households in South Africa, that's about uh, 7 million people, 14% of the population, uh, live in inadequate shelter. There is significant scope for further investment and capital deepening led by the housing sector. So on to your second question, um, how does you know, South Africa's development, economic strategy, uh, uh, developmental and economic strategy support um, housing as an economic sector. Um, well, starting with our constitution way back in the early 90s and the initial reconstruction and development program, um, which uh, came uh, uh, with democracy, and then the more recent national development uh, plan of South Africa, housing and human settlements have always had a priority place in government strategic and budget documents. The housing legislation in the late 90s and related housing policies have been core for driving the supply and govern, uh, um, by government and the private sector. So more recently, the resurgence of key human settlements policies, such as the Integrated Residential Development Program, also known as Catalytic Projects, the Social Housing Program, which is affordable rental housing, uh, highlighted the need for more holistic mixed-use housing projects that are close to socioeconomic activities, as opposed to the as opposed to creating slums uh, uh, on the urban periphery. So, housing, housing. For example, social housing has been included in, in our uh, new infrastructure fund, which is intended to provide credible housing project plans and also leverage private sector finance and expertise. Uh, in addition, South Africa has always had a progressive and pro-poor fiscal stance, which is allocated, you know, just directly uh, uh, to top structure housing, a, a minimum of 4% of appropriated funds over the past few years. 
towards low income and affordable housing uh, finance. Uh, and finance. Um, now, when you include other funding for municipal infrastructure, for basic services, bulk water, electricity, roads, public transport, which are all human settlements related, that can be in the range of plus minus 30% of the budget is allocated to these things. So it's a priority. So these are just some of the ways that the South African government is supporting and prioritizing uh, housing, not only as a social need, but as a driver of economic growth. David, please tell me if I'm speaking too quickly, but I'm gonna go on to the next question. So what are some of the urgent actions that can be implemented to drive the role of housing in a social and economic post-COVID recovery? Now you're going to have to follow with me quite carefully, because I have a lot to say here. Now, demand for affordable and low-income housing is far outstripping supply in South Africa, and we really need to scale up delivery in order to avoid a social crisis in the near future. In order to scale up delivery, government really needs to use the private sector more effectively. They have the skill and resources to deliver housing projects at scale and in a, lot, uh, in a lot quicker pace than government can. Further, South Africa really needs to change its subsidy regime. The current subsidy regime is, is, is rigid and static and doesn't really allow for leverage and differentiation in housing project delivery. So for the more dynamic programs and policies that I've mentioned, the integrated residential program and social housing program, I believe that a more net present value approach to financing housing projects, as opposed to a single rigid subsidy per unit is required. This will also incentivize the private sector to participate more um, as it will require better project packaging and compensation, but it will also deliver on government's required objectives. In addition, um, I believe that the South African subsidy housing program needs, to, needs a more disaggregated geographical differentiation. In other words, subsidy magnitudes and design should be, de should be determined by more local districts, so closer to the people, as opposed to a simple national-based blanket subsidy, which we currently have. Lastly, on this question, there is a serious concern about property rights in South Africa. In many circumstances, it appears that tenants and illegal occupiers may have more rights than property owners, and this creates risk aversion in housing investment and therefore reduces the amount of houses that can and will be delivered. This can already be seen in the leading and lagging indicators related to houses completed and plans approved, which are all on the decline. So as a start, South Africa needs to scale up. We need to use the private sector more effectively. We need a more dynamic subsidy system and we need to fix legislation and improve property rights and protection. In terms of my view on data and how that, uh, 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 as a basis for understanding and driving uh, the housing economy, well, having credible high frequency data is so important for both analysts and policymakers. Currently in South Africa, we have a wealth of data, including quarterly data from government departments on subsidy housing delivery, as well as official statistics on residential delivery by square meter, value, location, we have deeds register data, we have census and survey data, as well as a multitude of uh, other independent sources. However, there are still some serious data reconciliation issues, especially related to government housing subsidy, uh, subsidy housing delivery. Based on available data and some calculations, it can be inferred that between 30 and 70% of stated housing, subsidy housing delivery by government is unaccounted for or not delivered depending on which province and location you look at. Just for example, if one had to compare what the state has said it has delivered in terms of 2018 against the projected number of households living in inadequate shelter and taking household growth into account, we should have seen a nearly 50% decline in informal dwellings. But instead, the number has increased from 1.7 million to 2.3 million in 2018. So this is really an issue. On the other hand, looking at macroeconomic national accounting data, gross fixed capital formation appears to omit government spending on housing when looking at the residential fixed capital investment. So for example, if you look at, uh, if you look at the data, it says that almost 100% of residential investment was delivered by the private sector. But as I've mentioned, we know this is not true because government is spending a lot of money on, on housing directly and indirectly. And if we had to assume just government's direct spending on, on housing, 
this would mean that government is actually contributing around 30% to residential fixed capital formation, which is about 5% of total investment, which is significant. Now, there's many reasons for this. It's maybe because it is incorrectly classified and or not actually be being delivered, uh, but there is a process underway to rectify this um, and we'll hopefully see some progress in the next two years. So although we have really good data, there's serious concerns about the correlation and reconciliation of the figures that need to be addressed. Now, finally, colleagues, this is my South Africa specific question on what is the role of South African housing subsidy framework in the context uh, in economic activity generation and how the South African government is responding in, uh, to this in the COVID context. Well, again, considering that South Africa has a huge backlog for housing, as I mentioned, 2.3 million households, uh, roughly, which is also effectively a serious humanitarian issue as, as well as a result of lack of basic services. The COVID-19 crisis really has elevated and highlighted the plight of poor South Africans. With proportionally more people in informal trade, especially women, being affected by job losses and loss of income, the social and economic environment for such households has become more dire. However, the recent and positive shift in housing policy and funding towards prioritizing informal settlement upgrading in situ, so where they are, is optimistic and can rapidly deliver security of tenure, basic services, and of course, access to adequate shelter uh, based on a community-based model. This model will hopefully persist post-COVID to allow for a more rapid, incremental, affordable, and community-centric approach to housing delivery. It will also provide a sense of belonging and inclusion to these often marginalized communities uh, but will also play a significant role in stimulating economic growth. Thank you, James. That's, David, that's, that's amazing. A uh, really, really great summary of a housing sector I've spent many years of my life trying to understand. Uh, thank you so much for your inputs. Just some takeaways from that. I think the idea of a pro poor approach uh, that has become part of South Africa's um, housing agenda is, is very important. I am fascinated gross fixed capital formation decrease and hopefully in the in the conversation we can have further conversation about that. Um, I'm intrigued by your view of a more NPV approach, net present value approach, and, and, and I think that's also something that would be very beneficial to talk further about. Um, deciphering your disaggregated geographic differentiation or being closer to the people, again, I think has universal apl application of how one drives housing agenda. Um, a call for caution that even South Africa's potentially best data framework in the continent is still not good enough and, and shows major weaknesses. And finally, the recent policy shift towards upgrading are all critical elements which, uh, which we thank you for sharing with us. Right, I now want to, to move on to uh, Dr. Frank Gianfi Yaboa and specifically to get his views on those four questions, as well as particularly the uh, role that he sees for housing in the context of Ghana. Over to you, Doctor. All right, thank you very much, David. And uh, good morning to my colleague panelist. Um, on, on the first question, um, which looks at the role housing plays um, as, as an economic driver, in Ghana. Um, over the past you know, couple of decades since independence, um, housing has been viewed primarily as um, a social sector. You know, um, governments have sought to provide support for um, households to acquire housing, um, driven mainly by the need to um, improve the working of you know, households and to address social problems. Um, it hasn't been primarily driven by the economic you know, imperative, um, using housing as a catalyst for economic development. Um, in recent times, that view is, is, is shifting, but I think listening to policymakers and, and, and how um, housing issues are discussed, it appears to be driven primarily as, as a way of you know, solving social problems. Um, however, I mean, research has shown, um, I think David's presentation you know, bears that out, that housing can be a key catalyst to economic development. And in Ghana, um, you know, 
employment, employment generation seems to be something that is easy to point to when it, when it comes to housing's role in the economy. Um, you know, we have the masons, the carpenters, the, you know, the tilers, electricians, plumbers, who seem to get them employment building houses for individuals. Um, as has been documented quite you know, uh, widely, housing in this part of the world is primarily an, an informal activity, do it yourself. Um, people build through incremental you know, building process and often they engage you know, the tradesmen um, to help them you know, do each of these activities. Um, um, and that creates a lot of jobs for you know, um, people in the informal sector, which is good. However, um, it sort of um, dampens you know, the uh, benefits that we could create if it's much more formalized. Um, you know, the other aspect of you know, the role of housing in the, in, in, in the economy um, that has been also not been highlighted as it should, um, and I think David pointed it out in the presentation, housing as a store of wealth for households. And, um, a research by, um, in the, by the Ghana Statistical Service, the Ghana Living Standards Survey, um, found, for example, that 26% of households in Ghana own a house. Um, and however, only 1% actually own a, own a stock, right? And so for a typical Ghanaian household, um, the main source of wealth or storing, uh, storing of wealth is pretty much in the houses that you know, they own. And so, uh, and that obviously creates avenue for um, investments in other areas like, you know, trying to get, um, draw equity from your house to start a business or to use the house as a collateral, you know, to get a loan from a bank. And so, housing has to be seen in that light, that it has a way of um, helping households to mobilize capital to, to, to store wealth, which can then be used for other economic activities. Now, on the second question, um, how does Ghana's development and economic growth strategy support housing as an economic um, sector? Again, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say this again, housing hasn't really been viewed in the right way in terms of being a catalyst to economic development. And I think that has to change um, going forward. Um, so if, if, if you look at, you know, since independence, um, the first time we've ever had a housing policy was in 2015. Prior to that, there's been, you know, trying and error, so, so to speak. They've been de facto policies uh, that have been implemented. However, these were not properly, you know, outlined in any document that, you know, investors and players in the market could, could, could follow. And so, you know, that in a sense, has meant that we, there hasn't been a clear agenda, um, you know, to, 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 to use housing as a, as a catalyst for, for, for economic development and for job creation and for creation of wealth for households. Now, I, I, as a result of that, I mean, the, the current posture learned from the 2015 housing policy is for government to you know, be the enabler, right? And then the um, facilitator, okay, of the market to allow the private sector to be um, the lead in creating, you know, um, um, you know, housing and pretty much financing it. And so um, that, that's, you know, over the past, I think since 2015 has been the push of government. However, there's a bit of lack of, clarity in terms of whether that policy actually is, is being adhered to, to later. You'll find once in a while governments, you know, building houses themselves instead of either partnering or creating that enabling environment for private sector to try. And, and, and that certainly creates all kinds of um, inconsistency in terms of policy outlook, you know, for, for investors and for players in the market. Now, the, the third question um, really is looking at what are the urgent actions that can be implemented to drive the role of housing in the social economic um, post-COVID uh, recovery. Um, one of the biggest challenges we, we have in the housing sector in Ghana um, is overcrowding. We have overcrowding in our major cities 
um, and statistics show that 61% of households in urban areas live in a single bedroom. Now, most of these households have a minimum of about four persons to a household, and they reside in a one bedroom um, um, accommodation. And that clearly indicates you know, extreme level of um, overcrowding. And in this era of social distancing as a way of um, you know, limiting the spread of the virus, you, you, you can imagine what impact that can have um, if um, this is continuing in the future. And, and the need you know, currently for people to try to see how they can you know, um, have their own accommodation that provides a bit more space for, for the households to, to, to live instead of sharing you know, um, houses. I mean, the typical uh, household in Ghana lives in a compound house. And you have one bedroom in there with all the family members um, in that in a single single bedroom, and so that is a key area of intervention that has to happen. But that requires the investments that you know um, I don't think currently exist, and it has to be a mechanism that can be created to allow that investment to to take place going forward. And one of the reasons why that investment isn't ha happening at the rate that it should is that there are several constraints on both sides of the market, the demand side and the supply side. Um, on the demand side, you know, demand for housing is ineffective, essentially. Um, in most discussions in Ghana, we talk about the housing deficit, and there, this is a huge housing deficit we have across the country. However, there is an effective demand to back that up. And that is because the financing mechanisms do not exist to afford households the opportunity to um, um, take on mortgages to finance their home purchases. And where they exist, the cost of financing seems to be just too high um, uh, to make it affordable for households. And of course, there are other issues of um, low incomes. But I think the biggest issue is to um, make funding a bit more cheaper um, uh, for households. I mean, in, in that respect, the government, um, as for example, in trying to bring down the cost of local currency mortgages, have, have set up a, the National Housing and Mortgage Fund to provide subsidized funding to participating banks to allow them to be able to lend to households at, at, you know, at a lower interest rate. It's a good attempt, but certainly it's, 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 it's a short-term measure and it, it's not sustainable. Um, there's a, a limit to which you can support the market with, with subsidized you know, financing from the government because of limited budgets um, and, and for other obvious reasons. Now, the, the other challenge, which is on the supply side, obviously, is the uh, developers having a challenge um, in acquiring lands that are you know, you know, um, litigation free um, and that are secured in, in, you know, in that sense, um, security of tenor to be able to develop, deliver housing. Um, at, at much more affordable um, um, cost. So the, the key point here is that COVID has taught us that we need to develop more housing to reduce overcrowding. However, the constraints that exist will not allow that to happen if we don't work assiduously to, to, to remove them. Um, developers complain about lack of infrastructure, trunk you know, infrastructure to allow them to tap in um, roads and electricity and water. And these are things, if they provide themselves, increase the cost of housing to a I have lost communication. Um, that was um, unfortunate, perfect timing, uh, given that the 10 minutes was basically up. So thank you very much um, to Frank for, for those words. Uh, I think you of the social agenda rather than the economic catalytic agenda for housing is critical and that that is shared across many countries. The drive of incremental activity being the major outputs for housing and how one looks at catalyzing that as an economic driver is also very important. The government as an enabler, yet the constraint of government investment not providing sufficient 
um, underlying infrastructure to grow housing is, is a key issue. And in addition to that, the, the idea of, of Ghanaians... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I have taken, thanks very much. I, I have, I've been wrapping up on your presentation. We did lose contact um, and the 10 minutes is there. So I'll come back to you to finish up anything you have in questions, if that's okay, doctor. Um, I was just uh, recapping on the key thoughts that, you, that, that I got out of your presentation. Uh, the last one of which was the view that Ghanaians have of housing as a store of wealth. Um, being an absolutely critical one. And then a final point around the criticality of managing overcrowding as a COVID um, reduction strategy, as well as potentially being a route towards driving a new housing agenda that reduces impacts of, of uh, COVID and future such uh, crises that one might have in the future. So thank you very much for those uh, excellent words. I'm now going to to hand over to um, Dr. Michael Mbar, um to, to, talk to, to talk to us specifically around the Nigerian situation. Um, and uh, given, given your involvement in the central bank, Doctor, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts, your viewpoints on this topic. Thanks very much. Your 10 minutes starts now. Are you connected? Um, we seem to be having some linkage problems. Um, Hamadou, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well, David. Dr. Mbar, some time to regroup on his technology. I think there's a, a bandwidth break there. Hello, Could I ask you, Hamadou, to... Oh, are you there? Um, we, uh, I tell you what, I think just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask Hamadou to do his 10, 10 minutes now and we'll come back to, to the final presentation after that. Hamadou, over to you. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts specifically on the issue of the country private sector diagnostic and your involvement in that housing uh, strategy work. Thank you, go ahead. Thanks very much, David, and uh, I'm very honored and uh, humbled by uh, joining, uh, for joining this panel uh, to discuss uh, such an important topic uh, as housing. And uh, as most of you know, um, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, and uh, we uh, focuses on actually supporting uh, investment. Uh, in financing private sector, either through loans, uh, equity investment, and advisory. And uh, this topic around housing has been an, a very important topic for IFC uh, uh, across uh, the globe. IFC uh, actually invested since 2000, uh, close to $3, three billion uh, uh, in the housing uh, space across uh, 360 projects across the world. But in the Africa region, I think uh, the, the topic is actually uh, currently booming. And uh, maybe let me step back uh, to give some perspective. Uh, in uh, December 2016, IFC actually approved a new strategy. And uh, this strategy is called the uh, IFC 3.0. And the uh, IFC 3.0 strategy uh, is characterized by maximizing finance for development and actually creating markets. And as part of uh, this strategy, uh, we're looking to actually uh, create new market. The strategy departs from uh, previous IFC strategy 1.0, 2.0, where we have a more reactive approach where IFC will actually look into opportunity in sectors that are already matured and then uh, finance private sector in those sectors. But in the uh, 
IFC new strategy 3.0, we are not only looking at market that are mature, but we are also looking at a uh, market that where there is a market creation opportunities for and where there are binding constraints and IFC can actually lift those binding constraints to allow private sector to invest. And in this respect, uh, we have uh, uh, two units that actually support this market creation agenda. Uh, it's the Creating Market Advisory Unit, uh, which I belong to, and the Upstream Units. And uh, there is, uh, to actually support this agenda, there is, IFC brought in a new tool that we call the Country Private Sector Diagnostic. And the country private sector diagnostic uh, looks at, uh, a, at the countrywide, the binding constraint to private sector investment, and then zooms into uh, economic sectors, and then uh, carry out uh, a sector scan to look at what are the, the market opportunity in those sectors and then uh, what is uh, the feasibility and the development impact that this sector can bring? And then if there are binding constraints, lift those binding constraints to create market in those sectors. And this is how we got engaged into the housing space in Rwanda. We carried out the country private sector diagnostic in 2019 and uh, as a result of the country private sector diagnostic, uh, two key sectors actually came up as uh, sectors where there is a market creation opportunity. And this is agribusiness and housing sector. And these two sectors combined represent over 50% of the country's GDP. But housing alone uh, represent more than 10% of direct contribution to the GDP. If you look at across the region, in many countries, this is actually a significant contribution, direct contribution to the GDP, because in many other countries, this contribution is lower. And then, uh, therefore, uh, we, we actually choose housing as a key sector, as a key driver of the economy, where IFC can actually put its strategy and its force in to actually support. But beyond the contribution to the GDP, we are also looking at the fact that in the housing sector, there is actually a huge opportunity to actually develop, to support local manufacturing for intermediate input, where it will actually increase the housing sector contribution uh, to the economy. And this is, uh, this is IFC view, but it's also corroborate with uh, the, the way the government views housing sector, because in the government vision 2050, uh, housing has a, an important role, and more importantly, in uh, the national strategy for transformation, where housing is actually under the economic pillar, the first pillar of the government uh, strategy. And this goes to say how we IFC, we view housing as an important economic uh, driver and catalyst, and uh, how this also uh, corroborate with the, the way the government approach housing as a sector. Now, how IFC is actually uh, supporting uh, the housing sector in Rwanda, the way uh, we are actually uh, supporting uh, housing sector through our strategy is actually looked at uh, from, from the demand side, from the supply side, but as well as from the enabling environment uh, for housing sector. On the, I must say that the IFC approach uh, to housing in Rwanda is done jointly with the overall World Bank Group. And therefore, uh, from the demand side, uh, the World Bank Group 
has already uh, provided $150 million facility uh, to the government to support actually mortgage financing. And this is expected to bring interest rate in mortgage uh, much lower and to actually extend uh, the, the mortgage tenure uh, in Rwanda. But uh, to actually complement uh, this intervention uh, on the demand side, IFC is looking at a more sustainable way of actually financing uh, the demand. And therefore, uh, we are supporting uh, the implementation of a mortgage refinancing company. And this mortgage refinancing company uh, will actually have as shareholders, banks, microfinance institution, IFC will put a skin in the game, the government will invest in. And the, this vehicle is expected to uh, make long-term financing available uh, to actually uh, finance uh, mortgages in Rwanda. Uh, on top of the, the, the mortgage refinancing company, we are also looking at the capital markets uh, to mobilize long-term financing to support uh, key economic sectors, including housing. And uh, IFC has already put in place an advisory program that is going to support in deepening the capital market to uh, mobilize long-term financing for the housing sector. And on the supply side, uh, where we are also uh, supporting, IFC is currently working uh, with the government in implementing, uh, I would say, the largest uh, housing uh, program that hasn't been done yet in Rwanda. It's uh, the Kininga project where we are looking to support the construction of 10,000 housing uh, units. And uh, IF, IFC is doing it by bringing uh, private investors. And this is being done uh, in collaboration with the government through the Rwanda Social Security Board, the pension fund, uh, that is also uh, providing uh, uh, some uh, financing into, uh, uh, into the project. In addition uh, to, uh, uh, on the supply side, the other aspect that IFC is also looking at is actually how not to go beyond Kigali and look at how can we actually support uh, housing supply in secondary cities. And IFC has already carried out a feasibility study for a number of sites uh, in the secondary cities where we have identified uh, sites where there is a, a potential for a PPP model to deliver housing in those secondary cities. And this is uh, also how we are looking to support the demand side. And maybe finally to add, uh, IFC is looking to also invest into companies that have cost-effective alternative building technology that uh, they could deploy in Rwanda. Uh, this is how we are supporting from the supply as well as from the demand. But we are also looking at the enabling environment for our housing sector uh, to grow. And in this respect, there are a number of uh, areas that we have already identified where we'll be working as a World Bank group with the government to support those areas. This will include uh, the rental housing uh, market uh, in coming up with a proper policy framework uh, to support this. We are also looking at uh, the, the the condominium law as well as uh, the, the one minute the, the yeah finish your thought okay we are also looking at uh, supporting uh, the 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 investment uh, scheme uh, by carrying out a review to see how this could be improved. 
this is uh, for the second question. On the, on the, on the third one with regard uh, to COVID, I would say IFC had, uh, sorry, maybe let me step back because I want to also highlight how the government through their strategies also supporting uh, the, housing, uh, the housing sector. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, housing comes under the economic pillar and the government is looking by 2024 to increase urbanization uh, from current 0.4% to 35%, which means there would be a need to cater uh, for housing through this urbanization. And uh, it is, comes from the statistics that uh, there is every year until uh, 2050, there is a need for 70,000 housing units that are needed in Rwanda. And only uh, 1,000 housing units are actually currently produced, which means that there is an important need. And the government is looking uh, to support the housing sector through, uh, the fi through financing uh, in the housing sector, but they're also looking at actually upgrading the master plans across uh, the secondary cities and also supporting light manufacturing, especially with regard to intermediate input to housing sector. Now on the COVID- Sorry, I'm sorry to ask you to, to hold it there. I'm going to come back if you could answer your final questions in question time. My concern is we started seven minutes late and I do want to give Dr. Mba some time in the full normal session up to half past and then we will come back in questions to the balance of your COVID response, if that's okay, Hamadou. Um, I just wanted to highlight the, the critical things you've mentioned. I think firstly about the IFC 3.0 strategy being market growth driven and the idea of trying to find uh, catalytic markets rather than existing markets to grow is absolutely critical for the housing story. Um, and that that is leading to that money follows the potential and that there are already hundreds of millions of dollars that are finding their way into the housing market, which is excellent. Then that uh, I think both Rwanda and Kenya are identifying housing as one of the national strategies. Is important. And then ultimately your comments around the importance of demand side, supply side and enabling framework supports becomes a critical element of making a value chain work and therefore looking up value chain as well as at the core housing issues. So I also wanted to then highlight the issue of rental policy um, and that starting to find its way into the IFC and World Bank lexicon as well as into the country strategies, which is um, fantastic to see that happening uh, in Africa. So Hamadou, thank you very much. Sorry to cut you short. We'll come back to you in questions. Um, let me now hand over to Dr. Mba to give us the, the final input of the panel discussion on the situation in Nigeria. Thank you so much, Dr. Hello, David, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the, the earlier disruption of uh, technology. Uh, good morning, uh, fellow panelists and everyone on this uh, uh, session. I'm glad to be here to talk about uh, the impact of housing uh, on the Nigerian economy. Like um, uh, David had um, highlighted significantly in the main report during the last session about the role of housing and the work uh, they did concerning Nigeria. And so I won't spend much of it, but I want to say that uh, on his first question about um, the role of housing, construction and real estate in our economy, um, is quite uh, significant um, when you look at the uh, 70, over 70% 70 contribution of uh, residential and non-residential housing to um, our gross fixed capital formation. And then you look at the ownership structure of dwellings by households, which from our quarterly surveys at the central bank has shown that over 63% of the households own uh, their own houses. So um, it's then you now look at the ripple effects 
that it has. So when you see the construction and real estate uh, sector contributing a combined contribution of about 9%, but the impact uh, transcends that sector, just like uh, has been highlighted for other economies. Um, in Nigeria, you see it affecting the, um, influencing what is happening in the building materials in the manufacturing sector, manufacturing of uh, wood and wood products, basic metals, electrical products. So it's, it's um, this is them. When you talk about the other impact, the role also in terms of employment, uh, both the formal and informal uh, component of our economy uh, depend much. Uh, in the jobs that are provided in those sectors come from the construction and real estate sector. Now, on your question about um, how am I, Nigeria uses, uh, you know, uh, brings in housing to its growth strategy. Of course, at every point in time, uh, for a country with a population of over uh, of close to 200 million, over 200 million, um, as a date, it's always important uh, for us. So if, in 2017, under the ERGP, the Economic um, Recovery and Growth Plan, uh, the federal government, housing was a key part of that. And the government focused on both housing construction, skill development, um, housing finance, and also um, non-residential construction of, of um, government buildings. It was key in that. And usually what happens in Nigeria is that when the federal government says the pace, then the state governments uh, pick it up from, from there and then uh, and, and take it up. Now, um, but during the COVID, like your third question asked, um, it, it threw up a lot of things uh, about um, what is happening um, in terms of housing. And so, uh, during the brainstorming and the crafting of the economic sustainability plan uh, for the country post-COVID, um, housing became, was also identified as one of the key areas of focus. And, and, the, and the plan had to pick out, a, you know, a, providing about 300,000 housing units, you know, targeted at the very low income earners and the poor, uh, because the COVID showed that um, most, of, most of those who are not, not living in comfortable environments, in comfortable homes, found it very difficult to survive um, you know, during the COVID. And so um, the government in, in, the, in, the, in the plan that was developed for the post-COVID, under the economy, there, there was a lot of things that were brought into it, including uh, trying to get these designs at very, very low cost, um, like like um, the, the the plan stipulated and, and be highlighted by most uh, most of the government officials that participated. So the design had to be very affordable, um, and then also it's the plan also had a plan of the, the the target of using young Nigerian professionals and artisans, you know, as 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 an input, and then using local raw materials, uh, building materials to produce those, those homes. So that was a kind of uh, this. And then, so we are looking at that as a kind um, the first point um, to address the problem that COVID threw up when it comes to housing. Um, the 300,000 house, um, housing units will not, of course, address the entire problem, but it's just going to uh, address some of the issues when it comes to the poor and the low uh, income. Um, but on its own part, uh, during that period, the central bank uh, management also uh, developed a, a plan too to facilitate whatever the government is going to do. And so um, the governor in, in his presentation to the, to the economic um, uh, sustainability uh, plan uh, committee uh, propose that the bank is going to support the construction of more affordable houses. Um, of course, the, the, the plan will involve that private developers will, will be assisted with funding to do that uh, with evidence that they have off-takers that will 
buy up those houses that they are going to build. Um, the the bank also had also in that governor's speech, he also had a plan to add um, more funding to the mortgage finance sector, you know, to to boost the financing in that area. And most importantly, what the central bank had been doing earlier, which the governor highlighted in that um, speech, is um, encouraging the states to um, fast track the process of land titling and uh, development adoption of foreclosure laws that, uh, that can easily fast track investment in that area. Uh, the central bank had worked with stakeholders in the housing sector to come up with a model foreclosure law and um, some states in Nigeria had already started adopting it and you know, so part of the plan post-COVID to boost the housing sector will be to encourage more states to adopt it with um, some support from, from the central bank. Uh, so, um, and now after the, the bank, in, in order to fast track what the, has been developed in the economic sustainability plan, uh, immediately uh, came up with an intervention to ensure that the federal government achieve the 300,000 houses for the low uh, income and the poor. And so uh, the bank, uh, the, the, the intervention is about 200 billion that will be uh, passed on to the uh, family home fund. Um, the family home fund is supposed to implement that in developing um, houses of different, um, you, know, you know, at a very low cost for the poor, for them to access. Um, that's the, the starting point. But within the, the, the three-year period that the governor is looking at the horizon, other programs are going to come up that are at affordable rates that will be used to boost activities in the housing sector. Now, um, this, this um, interventions and the interest of the central bank um, in supporting the federal government of Nigeria and the states in boosting the housing sector is um, born out of the, of the fact that if for monetary policy purposes, you know, we um, consider the assets that are very, very key, you know, to, to investors. And so the housing sector, you know, has shown to be one of the areas that Nigerians are putting their investments uh, into. And so that's, um, that brings me to um, your, your last question in, on, uh, on data. And so the, the, the statistics department of the CBN uh, picked it up you know, in 2017, we we met with the the private sector arm, um, you know, coordinated by the Real Estate Development Association of Nigeria Redan, to work together with other stakeholders to come up with um, a, a data repository for the industry in Nigeria. And so, uh, through that collaboration, we were able to harness up to 15 agencies, both public and private and multilateral agencies like from the uh, support from the GIZ, the World Bank, uh, GEM, you know, uh, working with us to see that we come up with a, a structure of collecting um, data for the housing sector. And so, we, so we looked at it from four different uh, models. We, we try to look at the business data required from the business side, and of course, which will serve as a guide to investors. And then also the administrative side from the, the states and the agencies. And then also we try to look at um, getting the housing conditions, a survey that will give us data on how what is happening in that area. So uh, going forward, we, we've been we've done that. We've been able to start uh, compiling. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we we were able to do that in 2018 and um, 2019. And we sustained it, especially in the business data. Currently, we're able to uh, have the Nigerian Residential Property Price Index, which covers what is happening across all the states uh, in the country in terms of um, residential property prices. And hopefully, we want to take it up to come, come up with the um, commercial property prices 
uh, to guide investors. So those are some of the areas that um, the things that we are doing in Nigeria to enhance um, the, the uh, performance of the sector in our economy and also to, to make it more um, viable for investors and then create more jobs uh, in it. Thank you. Some highlights there in a very rich discussion, I think, is, is around the 70% uh, contribution to the gross fixed capital formation, which is fantastic, but no doubt also room still for, for further growth there as well uh, in terms of the total fixed capital uh, portfolio. I think the, uh, the, the it's great to hear that uh, housing is being mentioned in discussions as economic sustainability and rescue. And that certainly is uh, long overdue, I think, that housing finds its place in the economic lexicon. Great to hear about the 300,000 units that are going to be developed. And we look forward to seeing the impacts and the placement of, the, of both this, the support to the private sector as well as the financial sector support uh, coming from the central bank. I think it would be really excellent to continue to have these discussions around how one intervenes specifically in an economy from a housing friendly perspective and how we can start tracing and tracking the outputs from, from uh, those particular investments that are put in place. And ultimately then the data repository idea is, is always interesting to us. And I know for, from CAF's perspective, it's always excellent to find out what is happening, how data is being generated, uh, the reliability of that data and how we continue to grow what the data informs us in terms of uh, the, the general policy discussions and way forward. So that really is the end of our formal time uh, around this discussion session. What I did want to do is, is briefly ask Hamadou to answer one or two of the questions that have come up in the side panel. Hamadou, maybe you could just spend a minute talking about uh, sustainable technologies as well as the timeline for IFC's investment. Um, and then let's see if we can wrap up after that so people can join the other sessions. Thanks very much, David. I think uh, on, the, on actually the three points that were raised uh, on the uh, sustainable technologies, I would say yes, IFC is investing in uh, sustainable technologies. And uh, as you, you probably know, IFC came up with the EDGE certification, uh, which means that sustainability is actually important to us and the way uh, we can actually support this is actually to support companies that are uh, uh, bringing sustainable technologies in the market to invest in those uh, companies to be able to expand uh, the technology in the markets where we are intervening on whether uh, ifc uh, will support actually uh, social housing I think uh, in the continuum of the housing uh, uh, sector, uh, in the social housing space, our uh, sister organization, uh, the World Bank, actually support uh, social housing sector. I IFC is less on the social housing uh, part, uh, but more on the affordable housing uh, uh, segment. And uh, on the last question regarding uh, IFC timeline, we are uh, a development finance institution and therefore we are looking at long-term financing and not a short term to actually exit our investment. And IFC uh, exit to investment uh, takes, uh, I would say, uh, an average, uh, you know, close to 10 years to actually exit an investment. And uh, we are looking for a long-term support. And if, David, you don't mind, I want to actually mention with regard to uh, uh, COVID-related uh, support, IFC has actually put in uh, 8 billion uh, facility to actually support our client companies uh, to uh, not fall out of the market in the COVID situation. That's to support the relief. But in the restructuring and the recovery phase, uh, we are looking 
to actually support uh, companies that are build, that are coming up with effective uh, and cost-effective technologies because we will do need to do uh, less costly housing with limited resources. And therefore, this is important to us. And the other aspect I would like to mention is related to the enabling environment because we need to make sure the private sector uh, post-COVID can operate in the more friendly environment. And I would, uh, I would also uh, note that we are seeing the importance of data uh, as part of the enabling environment. And we think that institutions should be supported to actually build uh, a strong data to actually guide the policies uh, that we are putting in place. Hamadou, thank you very much for those thoughts. Um, we could carry on talking all afternoon with the depth of knowledge and uh, insights that have been raised, but I do need to look at wrapping up the session. So I just want to thank the four participants for their incredible insights and uh, navigating the technical jungle and still managing to put really rich discussion across uh, in, in this session. So. I think what is clear from this is that housing is starting to find its playtime on the national economic agendas, that central banks are becoming more open to discussing and uh, working with housing as a lead economic sector, that uh, development finance institutions are also starting to look not only at housing generally, but even at the lesser invested in housing, incremental housing, and um, emergency housing as well. One trusts that the lessons learned from the post-COVID experience will be galvanized and put to action to make sure that we get uh, larger scale programs of housing rolling out across all states in Africa, um, not only during COVID, but way beyond that as well. So I want to thank uh, James, James Archer, Dr. Frank Gianfi Yaboa, Hamadou Sorgo, and Dr. Mba for your incredible insights. I wish we could carry on talking further, um, but I wish you well, and I thank you very much for the time that you've spent with us today. Thank you, David. Over to you, facilitator. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you all.